And there we are. You should be able to see the screen now. Okay. So uh, this morning, our readings are a little bit longer than normal. Um, uh, because of the fact that the section, the subsection that we're working on, uh, which begins on page 52, for those of you who have the book and would like to follow, um, uh, did I get that right, actually? Let me just make sure I have the, the right pages here. Yeah, I'm sorry, they begin on page 51, my apologies. The section on myth and history, it's so short um, that I decided it would make more cohesive sense if we covered it all in one week. Um, so I've, I've incorporated, <coughs> I think, three paragraphs total, two of which are quite long, which we'll begin with um, this morning. So I apologize for that. And um, uh, I also have to make an announcement before we begin. I do need to wrap up today at um, 8.15 uh, my time, so um, in roughly an hour and a half. And the reason is because uh, uh, the Diocese of California is having its uh, diocesan convention today, and I'm a delegate uh, and need to attend that. And that starts at 8.30 our time, so I'll need to exit about 8.15, so I apologize. But if there's any lingering questions, I'm happy to to take them up uh, next time we meet on Saturday. So uh, let's begin. Benum Christ in it. I greet Christ in you. Welcome back one and all. Our opening prayer this morning comes from the Book of Wisdom. O Lord, you love everything that exists and nothing that you have made disgusts you, since if you had hated something you would not have made it. And how could a thing subsist had you not willed it? Or how be preserved if not called forth by you? No, you spare all, since all is yours, Lord and lover of life, for your imperishable spirit is in everything. Amen. So for those who are following in the book, uh, today's uh, reading begins uh, on page 51 under the subsection Myth and History. Our recently acquired insights about the origins and evolution of the universe offer a fresh context for understanding the intersection between the scriptures and the Christian spiritual life. Our scientific worldview is not properly a corrective to the biblical narrative of the creation and expulsion from Eden, because Genesis 1 through 3 does not in fact present a competing claim to the scientific origins of the universe. Rather, told in simple and primitive terms, Genesis 2 through 3 conveys a theological depth that provides a key insight into how we might interpret the human plight from a contemplative perspective today. Much like the parables that Jesus uses to convey spiritual rather than historical truth, we should not mistake Genesis 2 through 3 as evidence of the historical origins of humanity. Something much greater is at stake here. Something that will not allow this narrative to be relegated to the safety of a distant past, but that demands we hear in its telling the story of our own relationship with the divine and the tragedy of our own exile. In fact, there was no past moment in history when humanity, however long ago, existed in perfect harmony with God. On the contrary, our cosmologists are ever more convinced that it is not harmony, but disharmony that set in motion the expansive origins of the universe, a spark of asymmetry introduced into an infinitesimal singularity gave rise to an inconceivably rapid expansion of the space-time continuum 
that we have come to call inadequately the Big Bang. Without asymmetry, which theologians might articulate as a divine spark, the universe as we know it could never have existed. The ensuing evolution of stars and galaxies and planets, indeed life itself, could not have been without this asymmetry paradoxically built into the very structure of the universe. The chaos out of which the divine breath hovering over the abyss brought order and life. Although the ancient scribes of Genesis knew nothing of this vast incomprehensible process of evolution, these scientific insights into the origins and nature of the universe and our place in it allow for a new and much richer context for exploring the sacred narratives themselves. So our second reading today uh, follows on page 52. <laughs> Despite the appearance of an indifferent universe governed only by chance, a gaze into its deepest mysteries inevitably reveals an extravagance that begs the question why is there something instead of nothing? The very fact of a cosmos whose evolutionary dynamic gives rise to self-consciousness, a consciousness that itself can ask such questions while peering back into the universe from which it evolved, betrays a fundamental beneficence beneath every vibrating atom. Let there be light let dry land appear, let the earth pour forth vegetation, let the waters spring forth swarms of living creatures. Like pure white light through a prism, the singular word spoken throughout eternity gave rise to a multiplicity of form, dimension, and color, evolving as minerals, plants, and animals, each of them holy writ in the book of creation, each of them giving praise to the God whom they magnify in their very being. Indeed, to be divine is to be eternally, excuse me, is to eternally give birth to the all. Creation is not a moment in the past, but a perpetual birthing anew of this present moment. Each moment is indeed a new creation full of infinite possibility. Myth, it turns out, serves as a hermeneutical key by which the contemplative unlocks the Christological meaning of both history and the cosmos in light of ever new insights into the universe itself. What then are the implications of an evolutionary universe for Christian spirituality? So a lot to explore today. Um, our closing prayer for those who might need to leave before our discussion. This is taken from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Let us pray, kneeling before the Father from whom every fatherhood in heaven or on earth takes its name. In the abundance of his glory, may he, through his spirit, enable you to grow firm in power with regard to your inner self, so that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. And then, planted in love and built on love with all God's holy people, you will have the strength to grasp the breadth and the length, the height and the depth, so that knowing the love of Christ, 
which is beyond knowledge, you may be filled with the utter fullness of God. Amen. You have the floor. <laughs> Let's see. Those readings were a little dense today um, and long. So um, any questions for of clarification, I'm happy to address. And by the way, you're spanning about three pages. So if possible, if you could use your electronic hands to make sure I see you. Yes, Pat, please. And you'll just want to make sure that you unmute there. There we go. There you go. Okay. Um, what struck me about it uh, is kind of taking, um, in a sense, the opposite approach to your last question. Uh, in the reading, um, th that when people believe in that the Genesis um, passages are actually a story of how creation happened, I would think that then leads to a belief in dualism. Mm. Uh, that each part of creation happens separately, people being created the last uh, as separate from the rest of creation. And then, you know, uh, the verse that says has dominion over the rest of creation. Um, so I think that whole notion then feeds on a notion of dualism of us separate from God, us separate from creation, and then even within us, separate on the basis of race, on sexual orientation, on affluence versus poverty. Uh, I'm beginning to see that this can all stem from a notion of creation happening uh, as God did this on this day and the next day and the next day as it lays out in Genesis. Mm -hmm. Right. And what I'm trying to convey, you know, we've we spent an, uh, a number of pages, which for us means, you know, a number of weeks on um, on exploring the myth, so-called myth of Genesis and its value, particularly as a myth um, to speak beyond that which history alone cannot, I think, is part of the value there and to really understand that story as a story that is our own and not just about, you know, some parents multiple thousands of years ago. Um, and so what I'm trying to do then is to help the reader understand that the scientific worldview that we would refer to as the Big Bang and evolution is not now rising up as a modern or competing claim uh, over against our ancient stories of creation but that the original authors knew full well that they were not attempting a scientific view of the universe and that instead um, uh, were indeed writing in the realm of what we would call myth, uh, even if they didn't use that term for it at the time. And that so what we have are new insights that I think we can glean about the vastness of creation uh, and its beauty and the extent of time it took to bring us from the Big Bang to, <clears throat> to this moment where we as a, are an instance, um, as Carl Rahner would say, of the universe coming to self-consciousness. I mean, we are the only creature we know of, it doesn't mean there aren't others, but the only one we know of who can look back to the universe and see where we've come from. I mean, we can assume uh, that squirrels and robins don't understand the Big Bang uh, or anything that, you know, that, that brought us to this place in evolution. But we have this self-reflexive capacity to look back to our origins, to use our magnificent telescopes and scientific instruments to see the vast beauty of this. 
And what that does is not squeeze God out of the picture. Uh, some would call that the God of the gaps, where certain Christians are so concerned to preserve Genesis as a historical or even scientific um, story of the origins of the universe that they see wherever science can't explain something, they say, aha, that's God. The problem is the more that science closes those gaps, God keeps getting squeezed out of our, of our worldview. And I think that that's just the completely wrong approach. I just think it's what we would call in scriptural studies a form critical issue. In other words, it's an issue of recognizing literary genres this genre of a scientific paper explaining evolution and the genre of an ancient myth, which is not trying to compete with that scientific explanation, but simply has a completely different agenda, which is to explain our relationship with the divine in mythological terms. And so when we take that view and we understand that science and myth are not in fact competing, but actually uh, complementing one another, uh, we can understand when the psalmist says, um, you know, O oh Lord, you know, your thoughts are greater than my thoughts. They number as the stars. And even then I can't count them. Well, that ancient psalmist had no idea just how endless our stars, in fact, were. That's an insight we've only gained in the last, really, you can probably count in decades, if not just a couple of centuries so many of these stars that we're looking at are actually distant galaxies made up of billions of stars in themselves a, a conception that none of the ancients could have had right they just didn't have that knowledge so as our universe expands and we recognize how little of it we really know it enhances the awe and the wonder of our um, ancient text to be seeing much more than even those who wrote them ever could so we don't need to be afraid. In fact, I relish, I'm, I, I love the whole uh, cosmological discoveries that we're making. And I'm grateful to be living in a time that we are making these amazing discoveries because it just fills us with an awe that, that enhances these ancient texts without reducing them to some literalist uh, interpretation. So I hope that gives a little bit of a sense of of where I try to come from and what, what in a sense these, um, uh, these paragraphs are starting to try to integrate um, as wordy as, as they might be. No, I greatly appreciate that uh, because I did spend a few years uh, with a uh, more evangelical church that uh, would have repudiated uh, these texts and said that what Genesis says is how creation happened. And right. Uh, that did not set uh, well with me. I always had some discomfort in in my soul that there was something, you know, not right with that. So I greatly appreciate what you're laying out here in this book. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Pat. Appreciate that. Uh, that brings us to Sharon, please. Hi, Sharon. <laughs> Hi, Father. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I am really uh, looking at this reading through real events as they have been showing up in my daily life. Mm -hmm. And I have some very lovely fundamentalist clients who I truly dearly love. But, um, you know, we have been leaning into these conversations a little bit. So one of the things I hear when you write about... Um, the historical, um, that, that the, much like the parables that Jesus uses to convey <clears throat> spiritual rather than historical truth. Mm -hmm. I think it's the word historical that, you know, if I tried to convey that to them, that would totally like, you know, make them go off. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if there's a different context to hold that in besides historical i was wondering spiritual versus literal or i don't know but i just am trying to be sensitive to how words can trigger people and right. so i was wondering if you had like a different way of framing that um yeah and then the, when you said about the self-reflexive capacity i think that's the part that's missing, you know, 
a lot of times is really I see the difference in capacity with contemplative, uh, let's say, oriented people and the more literalist is that self-reflexive capacity. So if you could just comment on that. Yeah, for sure. So um, the, to come to your first question, what I often present as a whole lecture to my students when we get into this kind of work in, in understanding genres or forms of literature so that we understand the Bible is not just one type of literature. It's not just all history, which tends to be the default that literalists make, that if, if it's not historical, it doesn't have value. So if you undermine the historicity of a text and say this is myth, they hear that as undermining its revelatory value, right? It diminishes its, its ability to convey something truthful. And so what I try to do, so first of all, we have to understand that when we're reading the Bible, we are not reading, there are elements that I think are historical, even if, even if history through a theological or faith lens, they are purporting historical events. Um, but that's not true of everything, that we have a collection of different kinds of, of genres of literature, what we call in the, in the field forms of literature. Right, the, you covered that during your, um, the Revelations thing, right? The apocalypse, that, right, exactly. And it's, and it's incredibly important for us to understand when I open up a particular type of, whenever I put what we call a book in the Bible, it's the first thing I need to do is to determine what am I reading here? Is it a letter as in Colossians or Ephesians, right? Or Romans? Is it a genealogy as in the beginning of Matthew? Is it myth? Is it history? Is it prophecy? Is it a miracle story? And if so, is it a nature miracle or a healing miracle? Is it apocalyptic? I mean, you can go on and on and on. We have a whole library of different things. And what form critics do is teach us the same way we understand forms in modern literature, you know the difference between a memoir and science fiction and a cookbook, right? And if you mistake those, uh, if you mistake, you know, the Lord of the Rings for history, you're going to have a pretty warped view of, of reality, right? So it's it's incumbent upon us for to understand, oh, this is meant for entertainment. This is meant for teaching us how to cook. This is meant to tell us something about history and so forth and so on. Well, the scriptures are no different. It's just that we are so removed and so distant from those forms, we don't readily recognize them. And so we have to be trained or taught what it is we're reading. And we do that by by learning the literary cues that those authors would have used to signal to us. Just the way if I said to you, once upon a time, you can already predict that's gonna end and they lived happily ever after because you recognize the modern form of a fable. If I say knock, knock, you know to say who's there because you recognize that form of a knock, knock joke. Now, if you had a foreigner who maybe is non-native English speaking, wouldn't understand if I said knock, knock, wouldn't know how to respond to that because they don't know that form of, of, of a joke. Um, so we have to be trained into what are the characteristics of a particular ancient form of literature that appears in the Bible in order to know how to get the most amount of meaning and not to mistake or misinterpret it based on a misconception of its form. Mm -hmm. So one of the words I use if, if you're trying to, if you're concerned about historical is to help people understand the difference between something, what I would consider the difference between true and truth. Mm. And normally we conflate those things and say, well, if it's not true, it doesn't have truth or doesn't have the ability to convey truth. But all you have to do is talk about the parables of Jesus, who, for example, invented an imaginary story about a lost sheep and the shepherd goes in search of the one lost. That story is not true, i.e. it is not historical, but it does convey truth about the kingdom of God, right? I don't think even the most literalist minded Christian would would fail to see that the parables are invented, i.e. fictional stories that Jesus makes up. The parable of the prodigal son, which we'll be exploring a little. There was no prodigal son. That story never happened. Jesus made it up. But it tells us something beautifully true about the abundance of God's love and compassion and forgiveness, that God who rushes out to seek us on the journey and to bring us home. We don't have to invest historically in that to understand it speaks truth to who, who God is and what the nature of the kingdom is. 
And so if, if historical, you find that triggering, just helping people see that truth can be conveyed, even if a story isn't true, is, is a place to, and, and start with the parables. I think that gives people a way to understand really what we have in Genesis is more akin to a parable than the evolutionary theory of the universe. Yeah. <laughs> Does that make sense a little bit? So it's so you really want to separate true from truth as a way of saying we've got plenty of places we can all agree in the Bible these aren't historically true, but it doesn't diminish the truth factor. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, okay, Rowan, hi. Where are you? Sorry, um, I'm here. I'm masked. Um, so I was thinking that for me the word metaphor is more exact than the word myth, if you wanted to comment on that. And that um, it, it, it's sort of necessary that all speech about religion and about God is metaphor. And, um, and I feel very frightened by the word truth um, as my associations are that it's, it's a hammer to hurt people, um, but you know, I. so um, that's it. If you <laughs> might wanna say some words about any of those things. Sure, um, so I, I think that, uh, so I use the word myth because um, a scholar named Bultmann uh, originated this, what he called in his German Formsgeschichte, which is this genre criticism or form criticism in which he and then scholars after him really tried to do the work of determining and categorizing the various forms that we encounter throughout the Bible. And myth was a, became a clearly defined form within that field of study and my goal would be to, you know, gradually introduce people to the field, right, to the scholarship where they would encounter potentially this idea of Genesis as a myth rather than metaphor. Uh, metaphor also, it's similar to allegory, um, but metaphor in a sense does have a very specific way of associating one thing with another, right? You use a metaphor and we are really trying to point to realities that almost have a direct correspondence, whereas myth has this sort of more a uh, specific definition of being, uh, in a sense, a, a specific kind of story that relates humanity to God, or in a polytheistic world, humanity to the gods, um, takes place in a primeval time. So it's, it's different from a legend, because a legend is more about an actual person who lived, but uh, a story that is not necessarily true about that person, like George Washington, you know, I cannot tell a lie, I cut down the ter cherry tree. There was no cherry tree that never happened. That's a national myth that the United States has sort of created to trying to sort of say, well, we rest in truth and integrity and honesty. All right, that whole notion, we'll leave that aside. But in any case, it's a nice thing to aspire to. But nevertheless, we can say that George Washington existed even though the, the story itself is legendary, where when we're talking about myth, the characters never existed, Adam and Eve, um, Noah and the Ark. These are primeval stories that really have at their heart uh, either how we understand the origins of things or how we understand the relationships between humans and divine. And if you compare creation myths around the globe or at different times, it will tell you volumes about what that particular religion or culture, how they understand their relationship to creation, to their gods or God, et cetera. So in that sense, myth really is a very specific term uh, that helps us understand what the author's intentions are beyond just say referring to it as metaphor, which is its own thing. Uh, and just very briefly, I understand your concern around truth. I understand how, you know, how it has indeed been used as a hammer to oppress and to silence people who would disagree. Um, but I also would want to argue that there's a whole palette of ways that truth can be used. And I'm, I hope that we can use it in the, in the best sense, which is trying to get to the heart of ultimate reality and find some way, however, metaphorically or inadequately to speak to that. 
So, um, so notwithstanding the uh, the ways in which it's been used terribly, but I hope that I that shift between myth and <coughs> metaphor or that clarification helps you see why that's an important distinction. Thank you. Um, uh, as always, it's great. <laughs> okay, thanks, Roy. All right, and Christine, how you doing this morning? I am well, thank you. Good. And I'm this morning by the. Um, how the different readings serve as lenses and how scripture reinterprets scripture or can be helpful. Um, yes. The beautiful passage from wisdom, wisdom coming from a more unitive viewpoint um, it serves as a wonderful corrective when it says your imperishable spirit is in everything. And then the incredibly, one of my favorite passages of the prayer and Ephesians, again, speaks to this incredible opportunity we have to experience the fullness of God simply reflected in the fullness of creation. Yes. There really is, uh, and I use this word tension in only a positive sense, there is such a tension within Christianity between God who is always and ultimately and utterly transcendent and yet who permeates the whole of the creation. And it's precisely our Trinitarian theology that gives Christianity a way of conceiving or thinking or modeling the divine in a way that allows God to get outside of God's self and not remain just utterly transcendent, but to spill over, if you want to say, into and pour oneself out, as we see in that beautiful Philippians hymn, where Christ pours himself out, right? This, uh, that, that the divine is this constant outpouring of divinity into and throughout everything and yet remaining always transcendent. This is very beautiful. And of course, our, our, you know, we need only look at the sky, you know, only look to the heavens to see this magnificence and this extravagance, really. Yeah, and when we go to the inner world, the microscopic world, I mean, we see in, the own, in our own DNA, the double helix of this spiral that reflects <laughs> both spiritual and material evolution and new, new creations all the time. Right. It's beautiful myth. <laughs> And how much atoms look like planets around a star. And you have that, you know, that same structure in the microcosm and the macro. It's just fascinating. It's absolutely beautiful to see that symmetry. And, you know, who, and only really, we are living in a time where that has only very recently been made possible. Um, so it just expands the sense of awe at what the scripture writers were already referring to. Um, and trying to grasp at if uh, sometimes I think, oh, if the psalmist could only know what we know today, you know, how blown away they would be. And even at what they saw, it was magnificent, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> so thanks, Christine. <laughs> um, that brings us. Uh, oh, hey, Michael, <laughs> who's only listed as iPhone. But yes, I'm going to go ahead and change that if that's OK. <laughs> Michael, go right ahead. Uh, you just want to unmute. Say unmute. Uh, I happen to love this part of your book. Uh, and, and if I might give my expression or share my view of it, which is usually pretty simplistic. Uh, when, when the uh, Genesis was uh, written, the idea had a certain shell to it. And that was that a seven day work week was what the people at that time worked and they worked five days or rather six days and they rested on the seventh, which is what the story tells us that God did. Now, I'm not sure how we would convey today that God was home working remotely and, uh, <laughs> created, and created on certain days on the sixth day, he went into work and put a mask on. <laughs> but, uh, um, it, it was it was trying to bring the incomprehensible to a level or to a form that the people of that time could comprehend in their own mind. Right. Uh, I, for example, have, for the most scientific thing for me is to, when I read, tried to read Stephen Hawking's book of the universe. When I got to string theory, I kind of fell off the edge of the square world. 
and, and couldn't make it around the curve. Mm -hmm. But I had to just take what I could understand as a furthering uh, of what I knew of what I had questions about. Of what about this universe about me? What about God within it and within my life? Because I do know God in my life. I have experienced it, felt it. Uh, I try to live with it every day. I do live some of the stories. Uh, I have a prodigal son. And uh, I, I have to turn to that each time. I must uh, live with the fact that he is not living within the path I would like him to. And, and I just so wish that I could change him as I could see God wants all of us to be whole and with him. But he can't do that. He has given us freedom and we have to uh, find some of that ourselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, when, I, when I hear uh, an ultra literal taking of, of, of scripture, uh, I have to just feel that the person is trying to grasp on to what they can comprehend. And, and that may be different than what I comprehend and that's okay because it is still the word coming to everybody that's, that, that will look at it or take it in. And, and so it's a wonderful thing any way you, way you approach it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, just to comment on that, and I know that Sharon had been asking a little bit about this question of the self-reflexive issue around literalism, and I think you're touching on the same idea. Um, <clears throat> the, um, I do think that, to speak in broad strokes, the tendency from a literalist, if you want to say approach, is to distance, is to, is to objectify or take these texts as an, as an exterior sort of story about somebody else from a distant past from whom we have lessons to learn. The, what happens with a more contemplative reading of the text is to be able to contextualize that first of all and recognize, okay, we're not in fact looking at history, we're looking at myth. And what that gives us an ability to do is to interiorize the story, to recognize it isn't about some ancient people in a distant past whom I never know or meet um, who, you know, made a mistake, ate a piece of fruit and condemned the universe forever, right? But rather, instead, it becomes an interior experience of my own encounter with the divine, of God who searches for me in the garden of my own heart, in that core or center sanctuary where I come to know God most intimately. So the self-reflexive capacity is to, in a sense, interiorize these stories and to recognize that they are about what God is doing in me and not merely something I can, I can learn by reference about a story that happened eons ago. And I think that's one of the difference, differences that really leads to a contemplative reading to see the way in which our life even is patterned on the life of Christ, right? How the rising and the falling and, and, all, and the, you know, all of this is patterned on the very life of Christ rising within us, dying within us and rising again and so forth, rather than a hero I worship from the past who has led an exemplary life like a prophet alone, and now who I'm supposed to exemplify, exemplify uh, reading a, con a contemplative reading understands that there is an interior way in which Christ rises up within me, not merely as a historical moment in the past, but as alive within me, and of whom I am an extension, as Paul would say, as hand or eye or nose or, or foot and so forth. So that's, I think, one of the difference between, uh, the, you know, speaking in broad strokes between a literalist and a more contemplative approach, external versus interiorizing. I hope that gives you a sense, Sharon, if we, okay. All right, good. Um, thank you, Michael, for those comments. I really appreciate those. Uh, Gerald and then Nora will probably have to end with Nora uh, based on my um, duties to the uh, diocese today. So Gerald, please. Father Vincent, would it be fair to think of your teaching as a uh, <coughs> an originalist or a textualist in that you you look at the writing and the, the the purpose of the writer, who was writing, who they were writing to, and their understanding of the message at the time. Uh, Christ must have told the parables 
to the people he was talking to in a way they understood something that we we don't understand today until we go beyond the literal wording of it. And, you know, like even the secular Santa Claus story, uh, uh, and unless you have some understanding of where that big jolly fellow in the red suit comes from, right. Right. you can have a real twisted idea of the whole thing. Right. Uh, um, and I'm, is it fair of me to think of it that way? Yeah, I, I think to some degree it is. And, you know, what I think you're pointing to is, is in a sense, what I was trying to suggest earlier, uh, which is that because those types of literature and the literary sort of clues or cues that would trigger for an ancient mind, oh, we're hearing a myth now. Oh, we're hearing some form of right literature. We miss those because, you know, let's face it, it's in an ancient language, which is essentially defunct, right? Greek or, or Hebrew, even though those languages exist in some form, they're, they're incredibly different, the same alphabet, but they, they, they're they very different from the way they were used then, much the way if we tried to read like old English, and it would look more to a, an English speaking person like some weird form of German, uh, we'd barely be able to get through it, right? So, so those languages are essentially defunct and they're coming out of cultural context that we just don't have immediate access to. I mean, how many of you have ever really met, for example, a shepherd or know what the life of a shepherd is about? But to do that kind of exploration would open up just mounds of what, what kind of references or things could get evoked when Jesus is talking about the good shepherd and what those things look like for us. So there's a whole um, cultural, historical, linguistic context, which we have to reintroduce ourselves, right? Reconnect with to really begin to tease out these nuances. Um, you know, how many kids really understand, to use your, your idea, Gerald, that Santa Claus is sort of um, a deranged way of saying Saint, uh, Saint Nicholas or Saint Nicholas, right? That's where we get Santa Claus from. It's the Santa means holy. And then Nicholas, which is Nicholas, who was a Turkish um, bishop way back in the day, who, um, as legend has it, on Christmas Eve would put a piece of fruit and a piece of coal in the stockings of children in his village who hung them out on Christmas Eve. Now, we've come to think of the coal for naughty children, but in fact, the way the legend is told is that coal was to put heat in their fire, right? To warm them on Christmas day. It was a gift, not a, not some. So you see how these legends sort of evolve into these, into these ways we understand them today. Um, and to get to the heart of them, really just enhances the whole spirit of Santa Claus, right? Gives us a, a sense of its beauty and, and where it comes from within the tradition uh, and doesn't require us to believe that this elf is coming down our chimneys uh, every December 24th and so forth, but opens us more to the beauty and the spirit and generosity of a bishop um, in the fourth century who actually you know, is, this, is the root of this sort of beautiful legend we have. So the same thing is true of scripture. And when we overly literalize that, we see, as many of you know, in the South, in the United States, there's millions of dollars being spent on, on lawsuits trying to get the, you know, the Genesis story of creation uh, in children's textbooks uh, in, you know, whatever it is, fourth grade science class. Um, and, and that's ridiculous. It's, it doesn't belong there. It's a mistaken genre, right? It's, it, it's not, the authors of Genesis, are not, of Genesis are not purporting to write evolutionary history. Um, you know, I joke with my students, that's like trying to put those two things side by side is like taking the stork theory and putting it into our sex education class in seventh grade. It's just a ridiculous idea that we should think of that as, a, as an equivalent way of approaching how babies are born uh, and trying to promote that as an option for how we understand the, you know, the biology of human birth. So it's the same thing. The more we, we, we can dig deeper into the meaning and the nuances of these myths or legends or parables, it doesn't diminish them, certainly does not diminish their ability to be revelatory, but really expands it. Um, and by contextualizing it where it belongs, it really opens it up. Right. Thank you, Joel. I hope that helps sort of respond to your, uh, to your concern. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nora, please, how you doing? Uh, hi, Nora, you just wanna go ahead and unmute, sorry. 
First, I, I really want to thank you for a beautiful phrase today, which was uh, a perpetual, in the perpetual birthing of the present. I mean, I think that explains so well this ongoing creation that we witness. And I, I love that phrase. And so I, I tried to connect it with your ultimate question, what does it mean for Christian spirituality today? And what I see is that I'm part of that present. I'm part of the birthing. But it also is dependent, I think, on the way I lead my life, right? right? Yeah. And so, so am I, am I contributing to the magnificence, if I, if you will? I mean, I think that's a fair question for my life to the magnificence of creation by being a person of appreciation and of love, really. And so that's just what I wanted to say that your beautiful phrase led me to my present birthing, if you will. And, right. uh, and that's what I'm doing here. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. So thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you for that, Nora. Uh, Meister Eckert has a beautiful idea that he says, and what does God do all day? God <laughs> lays on a maternity bed giving birth to the present moment. This is a beautiful idea from Meister Eckert. This is going back, what, to the 12th century or so. So, um, so this idea that every moment is a new creation, every moment is full of a new possibility and of new life and of resurrection and of abundance. There's a Psalm. I remember Walter Brueggemann, I had, I had him in uh, as, an, as a graduate student, and he's a big Christian scholar of the Old Testament. And, and he pointed out, and I'm going to blank on the, the numbering of the Psalm, but there's a Psalm that, that, shifts from the past tense to the present tense in, in, the, in the moment when it speaks about um, God sustaining creation, right? You, you give breath and they come to life. You withdraw breath and they die. Um, and, and it just goes through this whole stanza of the present moment. And he says, pay attention to that because there is a sense in which that Psalm is speaking of this notion within a Hebrew context of that continual that God is forever sustaining and upholding the universe. It's not just something God did back here and then let it run like clockwork, that there is an ever, um, that in each moment, God upholds, sustains, recreates, and holds this whole thing into existence. And, and if for one moment God stopped doing that, it would just go away into oblivion, right? That there's this beautiful notion that, that every moment is being lovingly held and sustained by God's attention and love and, and spirit, which is being infused in the whole, in the whole of creation. And it's just this beautiful moment to really come to that deep sense of every single moment of my life is a gift. Every single moment I am being held in existence by the hands of a loving God, by the breath of the spirit of life and so forth. And that it's my, uh, my, uh, spiritual journey is to just simply rest in that and be grateful for that and to just uh, hold my, my attentiveness around the, the joy and the beauty that that evokes. Thank you. Like the reality. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I know we're at about quarter after, so I'm going to jump, if you let me, to the, um, to the uh, uh, practice that I would like to encourage uh, of you th this week. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen again and call that up. Um, this should come as no surprise to anyone. <clears throat> so this week, I'm asking you to choose a time, dawn, dusk, perhaps the middle of the night. I'm trying to be respectful of whether you're a morning or evening or a night person. Uh, pick your favorite time. Uh, and just to gaze into the sky. And I'm, I'm going to ask you to stay with that for a good 20 minutes or so, longer if you're so moved, the longer the better, actually. Um, and I'm asking just what arises in you with the stars and the sun and the moon? What, what is revealed to you about the God who transcends and yet permeates all things? Uh, as I was walking from the vicarage to the chapel this morning, it was still dark. 
and up in the sky hovered what had to be a planet, probably Venus or something. It was just this gigantic, gigantic light in the sky, uh, just right out this window where I'm looking. And I was kind of in a, in a hurry to get over here and get everything prepared, but I, it just stopped me in my tracks. Um, and there it was. And I thought, oh, I could, if I didn't have to get up this morning, I probably would have just slept through this beautiful thing. So set your alarm, get up before sunrise, if that's okay, and just notice what's up there uh, and just attend to the beauty of that and, and see what it reveals about God who is above all and yet trans, uh, permeates everything. Um, so was it Mars? Okay, thank you, Sharon. Yeah, I, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, okay, so it's a, it's a very, so Mars apparently is swinging quite close to the Earth right now. Good to know. So take a look at Mars. It's beautiful, um, stunning. So, um, so thank you all. I, 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 I unfortunately have a, um, this, as I said, this, we have our, our annual convention, which is like voting on resolutions and uh, it's all holy work. It's holy because it's miserable and we grit our teeth and bear through it. Um, but it is important because sometimes the resolu resolutions that come through are actually incredibly important, like divesting from fossil fuel energy and so forth. So these are important things the church has to do in its governance. And I'm grateful to be in a communion that honors uh, the voice of its laity and of its, of its priests and doesn't just sort of give things from on high. So it's, it's an important work that we go and let our voices be heard today. And that begins in just a little while. So I do need to, to stop us this morning, but next week I promise we'll go on as long as you have questions as we normally do. Uh, and I will also take time next week to explore both practices, the one I gave in preparation for this week and then the one I just gave now. So we'll allow time for both of those, all right? Uh, yes, Carol just said one less day in purgatory. Indeed, let's hope. <laughs> but it's still one day in hell. What can I tell you? <laughs> so anyway, all right, guys. Um, so please have a very blessed week. Go up, go and look at the stars in the sky and see the beauty that God has just extravagantly uh, rolled out for us in every moment. And I bid you, Ben and Christ in it, and go in the peace of God, the three in one and one in three. Amen. Mm -hmm.